because doctors should make these decisions, Order, not Senator politicians McKim, and you will be in continuation upon the resumption of the debate. It being 2 p.m., I'll call Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. I refer to Prime Minister Morrison's call to the New South Wales Police Commissioner about the criminal investigation into the Minister for Emissions Reduction. A spokesman for the Attorney General, Christian Porter, has confirmed that he was in the room during the call. Why did it take five days to make that fact public, and why did the Prime Minister Morrison fail to advise the House that the Attorney General was present for the phone call when he made a statement to the House five days earlier? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Very much, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, President. Well, firstly, uh, the uh, questions that get answered are the questions that are asked, and, and I might just and I might just and I might just throw Order. back. Why, why did Labor not volunteer that it was a partisan, politically motivated? Letter from the Shadow Attorney General. But that actually is the single thing that initiated this uh, partisan, partisan uh, that initiated this uh, whole process. Why, why, did, why did Labor not fess up immediately that this was nothing more than a partisan, politically motivated uh, witch hunt by the Shadow Attorney General? Uh, many of which he's, of course, pursued in the past. All of them unsuccessful. He is indeed a serial letter writer, a serial pest, and uh, usually unsuccessful. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Journalist for The Australian, Ms Nikki Sava, first revealed that Attorney General Porter was in the room for the call when on Insiders yesterday, and she said, and I quote, I'm told that the Attorney General, Christian Porter, sat in on that call while it was happening. Who briefed Ms Sava, and did any member of the Prime Minister's office brief Ms Sava, and if yes, why? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, President. So the question that I'm being asked now is who has briefed a journalist? Uh, who has briefed a journalist? Well, let me tell you, I don't know who briefs journalists. I really don't. And you know, I mean, I, I, leave, I leave it to you to uh, make those inquiries. Order, Senator, Senator Gall Order, I will order Senator Gallagher a final supplementary question. On Insiders, Ms Sava said, and I quote, Porter, as the first law officer of the land, should have told him not to make it, should have grabbed the phone out of his hand and said, don't do this. It's not a good idea. Did the Prime Minister seek any advice from the Attorney General about the appropriateness of his call to the New South Wales Police Commissioner? Senator Cormann. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. It won't, surprise me to hear, it won't surprise you to hear me say that I disagree with Ms Sava. I disagree with Ms. Sava. Uh, the phone call by the Prime Minister was entirely appropriate. Uh, he advised the House of Representatives uh, that that's what he would do after he was first asked a question by the Leader of the Opposition. He did what he said he order. would do. Order. Senator Cormann, I've Senator Wong on a point of order. Uh, direct relevance. Um, the Minister has not answered neither the part first order. nor the second question. The question is whether or not the Prime Minister, who this minister is representing, order. Maybe you should deal with the order. Can I hear the? I can't even. I haven't got my glasses on, so I can't see who I'm, who I'm responding to. <laughs> whether or not the Prime Minister sought any advice from the Attorney General about the appropriateness of the call. And now I hope the minister, given he's dodged the first two questions, might actually answer order. this one. Now, um I'm not going to deal with points of order on previous questions um, because that is not in order. That, 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 that they are not, it is not in order to raise points of order to answers to previous questions. The minister is entitled to challenge an assertion in the question, in this case a quotation, and be directly relevant. So I call on the minister to continue. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And, and of course, I mean the Labor Party is clearly embarrassed because uh, after they kept uh, this uh, key fact secret, after they kept this key fact secret, they were absolutely exposed for the partisan, politically motivated process that this whole thing is about the revelation order. of the Senator Shadow Attorney Corbyn General. On a point of order. Senator Wong, on a point of order. How is discussion of the opposition directly questioned whether the Prime Minister sought advice, Mr. Uh, President? I'm interested. I, I, as, as I've said before, um, I'm not going to pull up ministers. Directly relevant is not possible to police on every single sentence. The minister, the, minister, um, the minister is entitled to challenge the assertion, a quotation or otherwise, or a preamble in any question. I'm coming. Senator Wong, if I could finish before I um, take another point of order. Um, 
Well, can I finish this and then please, all, by all means, come to me? Um, what I will ask the minister to do is to, is to turn to either the quotation used, which I believe he was in order address, in addressing or challenging before, or the question asked at the end of that preamble. Um, as I said, glancing comments around other matters are appropriate because one couldn't police. Well, he was in the middle of a sentence, Senator Wong. I, I can't pull. I'm not going to pull up ministers in the middle of a single sentence. Um, well, Senator Wong, I'll take the interjection then, but quite frankly, um, the previous question, which you did raise the point of order to, referred to why, and I think the minister was in order in using those words in answering why the government did not do something. I don't think I can rule that is not directly relevant. There is a time to debate this after question time, um, and, and that's the appropriate forum for it. Mr. President, uh, Senator Cormann. Senator Wong can be as touchy as she likes. The truth is, and the reason the Prime Minister was forced to act the way he did was because the Shadow Attorney General is the one who initiated uh, a process in a partisan, politically motivated way, and of course being asked about it by the Leader of the Opposition in the House of Representatives. Order. Sorry. Uh, sorry, I was trying to deal with the order of questions I was being informed of by whips. Direct relevance, and everybody can see what he's doing. It is not directly relevant to be talking endlessly about the Opposition, as obsessed yeah. as he might be. On, Did the on, Prime on Minister this? seek advice from the Attorney General this, about the appropriateness yeah. of the call? Oh, on, this question, on, on this matter, unlike the previous two questions, on the point of order, Senator Cormann. Uh, the supplementary question that was asked actually made an assertion about the appropriateness or otherwise, putting a quote to me. And the only way I can answer that question in a way that is directly relevant to the question asked is by putting it into the context of the way this process was initiated. That is why I submit to you, Mr. President, that my answer is 100 per cent directly relevant. On the point of order, my apologies. I was receiving advice from, from, from senators about the order of questions during that sentence, um, which I occasionally do during question time. Um, I ruled previously the minister was entitled, when asked to answer about the question which started with why. That's a very wide-ranging question. Uh, on this particular matter, I, I, I don't consider um, the opposition's policies to be directly relevant. But as I said, I'm not going to pull up a minister in the middle of a glancing sentence. There's nine seconds remaining to answer, and I'll call the minister to continue. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, the only reason why the Prime Minister was forced to uh, make these inquiries is because the Leader of the Opposition asked the question in the House of Representatives without revealing Order. the fact Senator that it was Coleman, initiated time by a for the answer letter. has concluded. Time for the answer has expired. Order. 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 I'll call Senator McGrath. Order. Thank, you, Senator McGrath. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. Can the Minister please update the Senate on how the government is addressing real issues of importance to Australians, including through its work to combat the scourge of people smuggling in our region? The Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator McGrath for the question. Mr. President, the Australian government and our first priority will always be to keep Australia and Australians safe. On this side of the chamber, we understand that a fundamental responsibility of the Commonwealth Government is the security of our nation and its people. It is a result of the strong policies that have been implemented by the Coalition Government that the people smugglers' business model has been comprehensively destroyed. This has only occurred because we have stood firm. We have stared down the people smugglers. But not only, Mr President, have we stared down the people smugglers, we have stared down attempts by those opposite, of course, and attempts by the Australian Greens to water down border protection policy in this country. Mr President, when we were first elected to office, we put in place policies that the Labor Party and the Australian Greens said would never work. Not only did they say they would never work, they were fundamentally opposed to them. We have turned back the boats when they have tried to illegally come to Australia. That is a policy that has worked. It is also something that those on the other side said was impossible to do. We have introduced temporary protection visas, something those opposite still oppose. We are clear in our policy stance. Anybody who attempts to come here illegally will never be settled in Australia. Mr President, as a result of these tough but fair policies, we have ensured 
that the Commonwealth Government, the Coalition Government, has taken back control of border security in Australia, unlike the former Labor Government, who outsourced this important policy to the people smugglers. Senator McGrath, a supplementary question. Thank you. Why is smashing the people smugglers' trade at the core of the government's strategy to secure our borders and keep Australia safe? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, what we know is that when you outsource border protection policy to the people smugglers, you are admitting that you have lost control of Australia's borders. Stopping the people smugglers is not important just in relation to border integrity, but also to avoid the chaos that we saw under the former Labor government. Mr President, let us not forget what was the disastrous results of the former Labor government's outsourcing of border protection policy to the people smugglers. We saw 50,000 people arrive here illegally on over 800 boats. In fact, at one stage they were issuing a press release on a boat arrival per day. 1,200 deaths at sea that we know of. 17 detention centres were opened and over 8,000 children were detained when Labor were last in government. And of course, the now $16 billion blowout in costs Order, as Senator a result Cash, of and their time for the answer has expired. Fa Senator McGrath, a final supplementary question. Thank you. What has the government already achieved in disrupting the people smugglers' trade? And what are the current risks that threaten to undermine Australia's strong border protection policies? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, as Senator Molan knows well, the coalition government has ended the chaos under Labor's border protection policy by using Operation Sovereign Borders. And that's why I refer to Senator Molan. Turn back boats where it's safe to do so, offshore processing and temporary protection visas. We are proud. We are proud of our policy and the results under Operation Sovereign Borders. There have been zero deaths at sea. Zero deaths at sea. We have closed 17 detention centres. We have removed all of the children from detention. We have got all of the children of Manus and Nauru. We have increased the humanitarian program, Mr. President, to 18,750. And we've also provided a generous humanitarian response to the Syrian crisis through the intake of an additional 12,000 Syrian refugees. All of this, order. all of this, will be at risk Senator if Keneally, you ever elect order, a Labor Senator government. Cash, time for the answer has expired. Senators Watt and Keneally. Senator McAllister. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Attorney General, Senator Payne. I refer to Prime Minister Morrison's call to the New South Wales Police Commissioner about the criminal investigation into the Minister for Emissions Reduction. A spokesman for Attorney General Christian Porter has confirmed that he was in the room for the call. Were any notes taken of the phone call? If yes, will the Minister undertake to table a copy in the Senate? The Minister representing the Attorney General, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, the Attorney General was present during the call, and I am unaware of whether any notes were taken or not. Senator, Mc Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Did the Attorney General or his office seek any advice about the appropriateness of the Prime Minister's call to the New South Wales Commissioner of Police? Did the Attorney General give any advice to the Prime Minister as to the appropriateness of his phone call? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I'll take Senator McAllister's question on notice. Senator McAllister, a final supplementary question. Can the Minister explain how the Attorney General judged that it was appropriate for the Prime Minister to call the New South Wales Police Commissioner about a criminal investigation into one of his own cabinet ministers? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Given I took Senator McAllister's preceding question on notice, I will also take Senator, uh, that Senator question Watt. on notice. However, I would note that as uh, the uh, leader of the government in the Senate, the Minister for Finance, has made absolutely clear what those opposite continue to leave out of their questions and their assertions is that this matter is as a result of a piece of correspondence from a shadow minister in the opposition uh, to pursue this matter, and they clearly neglect to include that in any of their um, assertions. Order. Order. Senator Molan. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the government is addressing real issues of importance, including strengthening Australia's response to the Order. threat of foreign Order interference? Order on my left. <clears throat> Order on my left. I will call the Minister when I will be able to hear her. The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Hmm. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Molan for that question and for his deep and abiding commitment to our nation's security. Thank you. The number one priority for the Morrison government is to keep all Australians safe and secure. As our security and intelligence agencies have made abundantly clear, the threat to Australia from foreign interference has never been greater. This is why the government is further strengthening Australia's response to foreign interference. We are committing $87.8 million to establishing a new task force designed to disrupt and also to deter anyone from attempting to undermine Australian sovereign national interests. Working to the, working to the Order. Those opposite here actually understand this is important. So, working to the National Counter Foreign Interference Coordinator, the task force will be led by a senior AGO officer and will include experts from across Australia's national intelligence community, including the AFP, AUSTRAC, the Australian Signals Directorate, the Australian Geospatial Intelligence Organisation, and also the Office of National Intelligence, who will also support the task force. This task force will boost the ability of our intelligence and law enforcement agencies to discover, track and also disrupt foreign interference in Australia. It will deepen our understanding of what we know are sophisticated disinformation activities happening across the world, particularly against democratic processes and also elections. This new counter foreign inter interference task force highlights the Morrison's government commitment to stepping up our nation's security. And it also demonstrates our commitment to take stronger action to deter acts of foreign interference and also to defend against them when they occur and also to ensure that our laws are upheld. Yeah. Senator Molan, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister outline how de the defence intelligence agencies are supporting this effort to keep Australians safe? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Today's establishment of a counter foreign interference task force represents a joined up whole of intelligence community effort. This task force brings together a package of intelligence capabilities, including many from within the defence portfolio. And this is in order to drive the effective and integrated operational response to this invidious challenge to our nation's interests. The Australian Geospatial Intelligence Organisation in the Department of Defence collects and analyses imagery from data so that we can better understand the threats we face, including from foreign interference. This new package will allow AGO to provide greater dedicated support to the new Countering Foreign Intelligence Task Force. And to complement that, the Australian Signals Directorate also uh, will be doing work in support of countering foreign interference. ASD will establish a new team to focus specifically on targets that seek to undermine and disrupt Australia's national interests. Order. Senator Reynolds. Senator Molan, a final supplementary question. Uh, can the minister update the Senate on what other measures the government has taken to combat the threat of foreign interference? Senator Reynolds. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, the Morrison government is, has taken significant steps to strengthen Australia's capacity to defend against foreign interference. The establishment today of a counter foreign interference task force is the next step in responding to this growing and evolving threat. In 2018, this government introduced legislation to create new criminal offences and establish greater transparency around foreign interference in our nation. We also implemented electoral funding and disclosure reforms in respect of foreign political donations. Today's announcement of $87.8 million builds on the $38.8 million of measures this government has already invested since 2018-2019 to counter foreign interference. These measures include the establishment of the Foreign Interference Threat Assessment Centre in ASIO. And in conclusion, Mr. President, the Morrison government is constantly monitoring and reviewing these threats facing Australia so that our agencies have the right tools at their disposals Order. to keep us Senator free Reynolds. of foreign interference. Senator Di Natale. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Leader of the Government, Senator Cormann, representing the Prime Minister. 
Uh, Minister, last week Australia's emissions data was released and it showed that pollution from coal, oil and gas is at record high levels. Order and the only reduction on that is coming is coming from uh, livestock that's uh, slaughtered because of a climate uh, driven drought. Now, the carbon price that was developed, you might remember the first female Prime Minister of Australia, Prime Minister Gillard. Remember Order. working constructively with the Greens, Order. working constructively with the crossbench? Order on my left. Well, when we had. When we worked Order. Sorry, Senator Dinatale, please resume your seat. We'll stop the clock. Order on my left. We will waste time for non-government parties if um, I can't continue question time. Senator Di Natale, please continue. Well, as I was saying, um, the carbon price that was developed by uh, the Gillard government with the Greens and with the crossbench, that remarkable piece of public policy, it drove down emissions Order. across the economy with economic growth higher than what you're presiding over today, Minister. So, Minister. Why is the Liberal Party on a unity ticket with the Labor Party and refusing to introduce a Order. price on carbon? Order. I will call the minister when there's order. It is a, a, an uncommon situation for interjections to be flowing vertically through the table rather than horizontally, I might say. I will call the minister to answer when I can hear him. Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Let me just... Uh, say right up front that I reject the final uh, premise of the question. Of the, of the question. If I, if Senator I Watt. Uh, so fir first, of all, first of all, I don't share Senator Di Natale's optimism about a unity ticket between the Coalition and the Labor Party when it comes to doing the right thing by the environment in a way that is economically responsible. But the second point I would make, the second point I would make is that 10 years ago today, uh, the Greens had a rare moment of insight when they decided to back our position, Order. which is to protect the environment in a way that is economically responsible. I mean, the only party that has been consistent all the way through is actually the Liberal National Party. We have been consistent all the way through over the last 10 years. We have consistently said we support effective action on climate change in a way that is economically responsible. From Labor, we had the carbon pollution reduction scheme. Then, then we had the promise there will be no carbon tax under the government I lead. Remember that? And then, of course, we got the carbon tax. And I mean, from the Greens, we had them supporting our position against the CPRS, and then we had them supporting the carbon tax, which was never meant to come, which was, of course, a great deceit uh, against the Australian people. Let me tell you, we will continue to act consistently and in the best interest of the Australian people by meeting uh, and exceeding our emissions reduction targets uh, agreed to in Kyoto, and indeed by implementing our plan to meet our emissions reduction targets agreed to in Paris. We will not be sending jobs and emissions overseas, where for the same level of economic outputs, emissions would actually be higher. Uh, it absolutely makes no sense to impose sacrifices on the Australian people that actually would make the situation worse when it comes to global emissions. Shifting the problem uh, from Australia to other parts of the world where emissions will be higher for the same level of economic output might make sense in the minds of the Greens today, though it didn't <laughs> ten years ago. It doesn't make any sense at all to uh, senators on the Liberal national side. Senator Di Natale, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Well, pollution has been steadily rising since that wonderful carbon price that the Greens and Labor worked on constructively together was repealed. <laughs> And right now we're on track for three degrees of warming, three degrees. And your own department says that emissions are going to rise out to 2030 because you've got no policy. Isn't the truth that the reason the government and indeed the opposition don't support a carbon price is because it's bad for your coal, oil and gas donors? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I completely reject the Order. proposition that we don't have a policy. Order. I mean, clearly, Senator Di Natale, I'm, I'm enjoying Senators this novice stiff, I've got Wish to say. Wilson We've got McKim. this novice stiff between Labor and the Senators Greens going Wong on. Senators Wong and they, McKim they and Wish stop. Wilson. They can't stop. So, so if anybody is interested in the answer, I mean, I'm just happy. Get a room. Get a room. Order. <laughs> <laughs> Order. Se Senator. Order, Senator Wong. 
So let me let me let me other opportunities to make points. In rejecting in rejecting the assertion uh, underpinning Senator Di Natale's question, let me say again: the only party in this place that all the way through over the last ten years has had a consistent uh, policy position is the coalition. It's the Liberal and National parties who consistently stood up for the public interest, consistently stood up for environmental protection in a way that is economically responsible. Senator Di Natale, a final supplementary question. What uh, Melinda and Dean think of your policy? Order. Melinda and Dean are outside. They've got the remains of their home on the front of the lawns of Parliament House, and they've said, and I quote, "Morrison, your climate crisis destroyed my home." That's what they think of your climate policy. Why don't you listen to them and not your coal, oil, and gas donors, and do what John Howard did? In response to the Port Arthur massacre, reach across the aisle, reach across to the opposition and the crossbench, and work on a policy that's going to bring down emissions. Order, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. I uh, repeat again: um, Australia is actually on track to exceed our emissions reduction targets uh, by 2020 agreed to in Kyoto, and we uh, are committed uh, and have a plan to meet our emissions reduction targets agreed to in Paris. Uh, we are taking uh, action on climate change in a way that is economically responsible, as we believe is our responsibility and as the Australian people endorsed at successive elections. Senator Polly. Mr President, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Emissions Reduction, Senator Birmingham. The Prime Minister and the Minister have both repeatedly promised this parliament that they would cooperate fully with the New South Wales police investigation into the minister's use of a fraudulent document. Has the minister directed his department to fully cooperate with the New South Wales police investigation? Has his department provided all relevant data, data logs and metadata? data it holds in relation to the internet use of the minister and his office to the New South Wales Police. Order on my right during the question being asked. The minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Thank the senator for her question. The government's commitment to cooperate in relation to uh, the investigation around those documents is, uh, is firm and it extends to departmental agencies uh, as it does to, uh, to uh, government ministers and their staff. Uh, in terms of, uh, Mr. President, in terms of any requests for information that may have been provided, I'm not aware that any have been received from the New South Wales Police. Uh, if any have, I will update the Senate. Senator Polly, a supplementary question. I refer to the reports that Strike Force Garrard, established by the New South Wales Police Crime Command's Financial Crime Squad, is travelling to Canberra this week to interview Minister Taylor and his staff. Has the minister or anyone in his office spoken to the New South Wales Police? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Once again, I'm not aware of any such discussions taking place. Uh, if there are, Order. I will update the Senate. Senator Polly, a final supplementary question. Mr President. Order. Has... I want to be able to hear the question. Senator Watts. Senator Reynolds. Senator Polly. Mr President, has the minister been asked by the New South Wales Police to submit to an interview? If so, when will that interview take place? Senator Birmingham. Oh, well, Mr President, if Senator Polly was listening, I refer her to the answer to the first supplementary, and it's the same answer. Order. Senator Roberts. Order. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Senator McKenzie. Minister, farmers are here en masse and want answers to these questions they gave my office. The major storage dams of the lower Murray-Darling Basin are currently holding about 7,500 gigalitres of water. That's 7.5 trillion litres. Yet farmers along the basin in New South Wales and Victoria are receiving zero allocation for general security water. I'll say it again. These farmers can visit their water in those dams. They can watch water flow past their properties on the way to irrigate forests. They just can't have any. Minister, will you release 1,000 gigalitres, just 13 per cent of the water in storage, to the states for general security water so our farmers can grow food and fibre for Australia and the world? The Minister for Agriculture, Senator McKenzie. I might answer this. Thank you, Senator, um, in my capacity as representing the Minister for Water, um, Minister Littleproud. 
the two million Australians that live and work throughout the Murray-Darling Basin system are actually providing food and fibre not just for our entire country but for the world. It is a hub of clean, green, safe, sustainable food production, and it is also a place in my home state of Shepparton through the Goulburn Valley and I know uh, in other areas through particularly New South Wales, the hub of food manufacturing. And so there are tens of thousands of Australians on farm and off farm in these communities who rely on water to be able to ensure that they can continue to do uh, what they've been doing for decades and in many cases uh, generations. We know these uh, communities are under pressure. And I was one of the first people in this place uh, coming back from the election to be talking about the heartache of when you are a farmer in drought and seeing water flow right past your front gate to water an environmental asset far, far away. It is heartbreaking. Uh, and I think coming, these farmers have had to come to uh, parliament, and that is why we have actually been making order. changes since Senator we Hanson came to parliament. I've got Senator Hanson on a point of order, Senator Mackenzie. Point of order. There's 30, just over 30 seconds left to the question. She is not answering the question. Will they release 1,000 gigalitres of water to the farming okay. sector? Can, she has can not I, even touched on that part of the question whatsoever. Can I, I don't, well, you go, can I go to the point of direct relevance and I again ask senators not to simply restate a preferred part of a question but to point, bring the point of order to that of direct relevance? Now, can I remind the Senate of what direct relevance means in contrast to what relevance used to mean. It used to mean, to quote um, a ruling of President Baker, that a minister's, if a, for example, if a, minister's quest, if a question concerned the state of the economy, the minister's answer is relevant if it referred to the state of the economy. President Behan said relevance means relevance to the subject matter of the question. The Senate changed the standing orders to require answers to be directly relevant. Now, in my view, to be directly relevant, means that an answer must directly refer to or address, including challenging, material or assertions contained in a question or any preamble, i.e. it is a narrower test than simply dealing with the same subject matter. It shouldn't deal with the motives of people asking questions unless those motives are assigned in the question itself, and therefore it would be in order for a minister to challenge those. I just want to remind senators of that because direct relevance is a narrower test than relevance, which was the old subject matter. So, um, Minister, the, Senator Hanson highlighted part of her question. I can't direct you how to answer a question as long as you are directly relevant to part of the question. And it was a lengthy question in this case with a preamble, Senator Hanson. So I'll listen carefully to the minister and ask her to continue. Uh, well. I took the question to be meaning we need more water in basin communities who are suffering from drought and from near zero allocations in some states and very low allocations in others. And in these conditions, what water there is for the environment is being used cautiously uh, to minimise irreversible damage. At the beginning of August, the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder commenced the delivery of the Southern Spring Flow, targeting environmental outcomes. And I think it's useful to note that under the Water Act, it does not allow water set aside for the environment to be given to a farmers either as a loan or as a gift. Senator, Han uh, Senator Roberts, a supplementary question. Thank you. Minister, if this water is just too important to give farmers for food and fibre for Australians and the world, can you tell this place what that water is reserved for? If farmers are not going to get it, who is going to get that 7.5 thousand gigalitres, that 7.5 trillion litres? Senator Mackenzie. Well, this is one of the tragedies of this situation, that without more water in the Murray-Darling Basin system uh, from the skies to Senator um, Louise's uh, actual Pratt's um, point, then it is very hard to create new water in the system. We are building water infrastructure. We're the side of politics that actually put a halt to buybacks, that sought to get any more efficiencies out of this system through investing in on-farm infrastructure. If the other team had have been elected, they'd be getting their checkbook right now and walking on farms taking water. 
We refused to do that. It was we who capped it. We who have actually put the socio-economic criteria so that you cannot remove one more gigalitre from these communities because we know, because we live in these communities, Order. the reprehensible damage removing one more gigalitre from the Murray-Darling Basin communities will actually have, not just on farmers' productive capacity, but indeed on their own local communities Order, to sustain. Senator McKenzie. Senator Roberts, a final supplementary question. Minister, as agriculture minister who fails an agriculture minister who fails to help her agriculture, whether on her own account or due to her party, is by any definition a failure. Will you resign? Senator McKenzie. Order. Order in the galleries. Order in the galleries. Please remove that gentleman. Attendance. That's utterly inappropriate behaviour. Remove. I will not tolerate interjections from the galleries. It's impolite to other citizens who are also here. Senator McKenzie. Well, thank you very much. Uh, no, Senator Roberts, I won't be resigning. Uh, it is actually our side of government that agriculture and mining communities right throughout regional Australia backs to deliver for them. Your party. Your party seeks to stop free trade agreements, Sorry. which have led Sorry, to— Sorry, Senator McKenzie. Is someone going to own up there, have the courage to own up? Are you going to have the courage to own up, or are you going to hide behind— All right, please, please, Can we please remove the gentleman? This is not inappropriate. It is utterly inappropriate. There, it, it, uh, it is completely disrespectful to your fellow citizens to behave that way. Senator McKenzie, please continue. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. It is our side of politics and myself included that backs accessing more markets so that our farmers, who do export 70 per cent of what they grow, when one in five Australians owes their job to our status as a trading nation, to back free trade rather than want to close us off to markets of the world. We are the side of politics that's put $22 million on the table at the election to support Australian dairy farmers, not just through a mandatory code of conduct to ensure that the eight very unique and challenged dairy industry regions in this country can come together and support a mandatory code of conduct to stop the egregious behaviour of milk processes Order, against farmers. Senator McKenzie. Senator Davey. Order. Good. Order. Thank you, President. Now, as a senator myself who lives in the regions in an area where we are on 0 per cent allocation, who understands exactly how hard and how frustrating it is for our people, can you explain to the chamber what the Liberals with the Nationals in government are doing to take practical steps during this drought, including how we are making water available to farmers to support livestock and breeding herds in order to improve recovery when the drought breaks. Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Senator Davey. You know better than anyone in this Order. place as an irrigator yourself just how hard it is out there at the moment. The Nationals and Liberals in government are acting to help drought-affected farmers to ensure access to water to grow fodder, to help farmers elsewhere suffering from drought to keep their breeding stock and the years that they've invested in developing the genetics alive. As part of our government's last round of support for drought-affected farmers, Commonwealth and South Australian governments have struck a deal to secure 100 gigalitres of water so that farmers can grow fodder, silage and pasture at a discounted rate. By ramping up production, the South Australian government has agreed to sell up to 100 gigalitres of water allocations from metropolitan account drawn from the River Murray to drought-affected farmers. This means the water provided to farmers under the Water for Fodder program will be completely replaced by water produced by the Adelaide desalination plant, and that is great for farmers both up and down the river. It will meet an extra 120,000 tonnes of feed will be available than if we'd not worked with the South Australian government to deliver this program. As a condition of applying for the program, irrigators will need to agree that they will not on-sell the water and will only grow fodder and pasture with the water they receive. Applicants will be required to provide evidence that they've grown the fodder where they said they would. At $100 a megalitre, this water is incredibly heavily discounted. Farmers can apply from the second week of December and water will start to flow before Christmas. This water must be used to produce fodder or pasture. 
farmers can buy up to water in 50 megalitre lots with a maximum purchase of 100 megs. The Water for Fodder program will make a meaningful difference for farmers in need and will help improve fodder production for drought affected stock right throughout the country. And when those who have decided to adjust their breeding stock in areas that are less affected by the drought, there's $1 billion worth of loans available to them and small businesses at interest and repayment free for at least Order. two years. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. And can you update the Senate on the government's achievements in supporting our farmers, including this Water for Fodder Order. program, which is providing real water to farmers at discounted rates for production of fodder? Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Senator Davey. The Liberal and Nationals government supports farmers and rural communities to build resilience and preparedness for drought. Our drought strategy comes in three parts immediate support for those affected support for regional communities and building for long-term resilience. We're making immediate support available through the Farm Household Allowance, additional financial counselling services, drought community support programs, mental health and wellbeing programs, interest-free concessional loans which can see farm businesses save up to $150,000 in interest and repayments alone, and generous tax measures. Our three-point plan will help make sure our rural industries get through and recover from this drought so that they can make the most of our growing global market access and our strong reputation as a trader. The Water and Fodder program is one example of that direct support we are providing for our farmers. We will it also not reduce the security Order. of water supply in South Australia, so Order. it's a win for Senator farmers McKenzie, up and down the Please basin. resume your order on my left. It uh, order, Senator Cormann, on a point of order. Um, if it's about what's happening on, a, on my on left. On a point of order. I mean, order. Mr. 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 President, interjections are disorderly, always disorderly. The level of interjections coming from the Labor Party are com is completely and utterly unacceptable. In fact, it's bordering on bullying. Order, order on my left. Can I ask, on my left, give it order? If I'm making a ruling, be quiet. Where we've had interjections from the gallery, it is particularly unhelpful for senators to be encouraging, otherwise acknowledging that. For the dignity of the chamber and all senators, as well as our fellow citizens here watching this. Senator Davey, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister inform the Senate when the Water for Fodder program will be open? And more importantly, other than the idea of taking a bulk water volume off uh, from our bulk water resources, which is in, owned by someone, and undermining the property right of water, which farmers have fought so hard for, are there any alternative approaches to get water to our farmers? Senator McKenzie. Oh, thank you very much, Mr President. The Water for Fodder program guidelines were released yesterday, which will enable our farmers to access 50 megs of water at heavily discounted prices of $100 a meg. Of the 100 gigalitres now available in the Murray-Darling Basin, there will be 40 gigalitres of water available under the program in round one, which will be uh, for use in this uh, water year, 1920. Applications for this real water open on the 9th of December this year. Farmers will be able to apply for 50 megalitres of water in each allocation account they hold, and when you hold more than two uh, allocations account, they can submit a maximum of two applications. We will then make 60 gigalitres available in round two for use in the next water year, which is 2021. Farmers will be able to apply for the second instalment of the program in April next year. This is a new and innovative approach to making new and additional water available in the basin during times of drought. It's never been done before. It highlights what's possible when basin states work together, and it's part of us ensuring our breeding order, herd Senator is sustained. McKenzie. Senator Green. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Senator McKenzie. I refer the minister to her letter that she wrote to Senator Hanson on 16 October 2019 about when the Dairy Code of Conduct would commence. Can the minister confirm that she made a commitment to Senator Hanson that she is planning to implement the Dairy Code of Conduct by December this year? When will the Dairy Code of Conduct actually come into effect? The Minister for Agriculture, Senator McKenzie. Well, thank you very much for your, Senate, uh, your question, Senator. It's great to hear the Labor Party uh, concerned about ensuring the sustainability of the dairy industry here in Australia. 5,200 dairy farmers 
who we have stood with from day one. It was our, our government that set up the ACCC inquiry on the back of the clawbacks that Murray Goulburn and Fonterra instigated. It was we that uh, got the ACCC to do an, a very detailed inquiry into the industry, and it is that inquiry's recommendations to implement a draft mandatory code that we're actually delivering. That we're actually delivering. We took that policy to the federal election, along with $22 million worth of other support for our dairy farmers. We Senator, didn't put a floor Senator price Wong to the on people. The point of order. Thank you, Mr. President. And I'm conscious of the lengthy um, ruling you gave us earlier on direct relevance, but that uh, whilst there were two preceding paragraphs, the question is when the code will come into effect. We ask the, the minister to be directly yeah, relevant. On, on the point of order, I, I have allowed when I um, made rulings on direct relevance for ministers to provide some context, some context, but I remind the minister of the question. Um, there were two questions there plus the reference, um, and you've reminded the minister of the second bit, but I remind the minister of that. Senator McKenzie. Well, thank you very much. Um, I don't need any reminding. We're keen to get that mandatory draft code of conduct that we promised at the election in place as soon as possible. And to that end, an exposure draft was uh, consulted with the dairy industry over the last four weeks. And we are keen on making sure we restore the bargaining power to dairy farmers when they are in contract negotiation with processors. The mandatory code of conduct everyone in this chamber will be rapt to hear is on track to be in place by 1 January 2020. Rather than a watered-down code, this code will improve contractual arrangements between dairy farmers and their processors, help rebalance the bargaining power and improve transparency of the transactions. The code was a key recommendation, as I said, of the ACCC report, and we have done consultations prior uh, to the federal election. We've also consulted on the exposure draft post. And we are now working with industry to ensure that this is a code that actually delivers for each of the eight very unique dairy industries. As I've said, what works in WA and Queensland Senator McKenzie, won't work time in Tasmania. For the expired. Senator Green, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. I refer the minister to reports that Senator Macdonald has written to Coles and Woolworths chief executives, as well as major milk processors, urging them to sign up Order. to the proposed code of conduct and commit Finally. to paying fairer milk prices immediately. Are the minister's own backbenchers now simply bypassing her because they know how ineffective the minister actually is? Senator McKenzie. Well, thank you very much for the question. It gives me uh, an opportunity to actually talk about the great work of Senator Macdonald yeah. in actually supporting uh, dairy farmers, not just in Queensland but right around the country, in the face of Labor's failed policy perspective that is supported by Senator Hanson against the wishes of the majority of dairy farmers in this country, and that's for a floor price, which would actually decimate uh, dairy's ability to bargain and receive a fair price. What we're interested in on this side of the parliament is a fair price for our dairy farmers, not a floor price. And that's exactly what Susie Macdonald is championing. It's exactly right. The supermarkets have to be held for account. You can't walk out into the public sphere and say, oh, the drought's going to drive up meat prices. The drought's going to drive up horticulture costs for consumers, and then fail fail to enter into negotiations with processes that would see the impact of the drought on high water, high fodder uh, costs on our dairy farmers actually say that Order. consumers Senator are going to have McKenzie, to pay more time for their for the milk. Answers expired. Senator Green, a final supplementary question. Can the minister confirm that the Dairy Code of Conduct does not cover major supermarkets such as Coles and Woolworths? And did Senator Macdonald seek advice from the minister prior to writing to Coles and Woolworths executives as well as major milk processors? Senator McKenzie. The supply chain. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I was just going to say, we'll walk you through the supply chain. So, um, when it comes to getting a bottle of milk on the shelves of supermarkets in this country, the farmer produces the milk, the processor comes and picks it up pays a price for that, processes it, and then has a relationship with the retailer.
It is that particular relationship between the processor and the retailer that is governed by Order. the Food and Grocery uh, Code of Conduct. And what we are seeking to do is actually implement uh, a code, a mandatory code, not a voluntary one, that will govern the relationship between the producer and the processor, because it is a relationship that is mired in a lack of transparency, uh, that sees some farmers pay different prices around the country and played off against each other. So we're seeking to have a code that will deliver a fair price from the processors to producer, and we also want supermarkets to step up and pay the processor a fair price for their milk. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Canavan. Can the Minister outline how the Liberal National Government is addressing real issues of importance for Australians, including record investment in infrastructure? and how this will better connect our cities and regions, particularly in my home state of New South Wales. The Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Canavan. Well, thank you very much, Mr President. I thank Senator Hughes uh, for her question and I recognise her strong passion to support infrastructure in New South Wales, especially in regional New South Wales. And we are, Mr President, getting on with the job of investing in nation-building infrastructure in this country that helps to boost jobs, cut travel times, make for safer roads and also unlock the potential, the enormous potential that we have in our nation's regions. Mr President, we are investing at the moment a record uh, amount of more than $100 billion in infrastructure over the next 100 years. As I said in this place last week, the 130-odd projects we are investing in uh, across Australia will support 85,000 jobs. Now that is more, Mr. President. There's more jobs than people have come to watch the second cricket test match between Adelaide, between Australia and Pakistan in Adelaide in the first three days. There's a lot of jobs in that, Mr. President. And I can, I'm sure Senator Colbeck can confirm it's also, also, Mr. President, more people than turned up to watch our politicians v. Press cricket match yesterday in Canberra. There's a lot of jobs, a lot of jobs across New South Wales, Mr. President. We are investing in the $5.6 billion in the Pacific Highway, saving up to two and a half hours on that journey. That's going to support 2,800 direct jobs, 8,400 indirect jobs, Mr. President. We're investing in the West Connects program in Sydney. That will save people 40 minutes coming from Western Sydney to the city. Uh, uh, that's a huge, huge saving for those people who have to put up with that commute. 10,000 jobs in that project alone as well. And of course, we're also, also supporting the Western Sydney Airport, a real uh, nation-building project for our country, supporting a second major airport in Sydney, a $5.3 billion project, project 11,000 direct jobs and more, and more than that, 13,000 ongoing jobs as well in that project, Mr President. All of these jobs, all of these projects, sorry, help support jobs around our economy directly in their construction, but almost more importantly, they unlock our nation's potential over the long term to create even more jobs and stronger industries. Order. Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline the government's achievements in infrastructure and the benefits of bringing forward these investments? Senator Canavan. Well, Mr President, uh, uh, we are not only investing record amounts in infrastructure, we have been working hard to look at ways of bringing forward those investments as well to support our economy and get those enormous benefits I described out to the Australian people as soon as possible. Obviously, we've had to work with state and territory governments to do those bring forwards because all of these projects are done in coordination with state and territory governments. And it was great news that last month the Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Minister announced that in New South Wales alone more than $500 million of road investments would be brought forward. They include $185 million on the Toowoomba to Seymour uh, uh, road upgrade, most of which goes through New South Wales. It includes $200 million investment in the Newell Highway, a really important project because that helps support communities uh, that are affected by one of the worst droughts in our nation's history at the moment, bringing jobs to those depressed areas, and $145 million on the Prince's Highway as well. Mr President, all of these bring forwards will mean jobs coming to the Australian economy, jobs coming That's to a town right. near you as soon as possible, and we're working, we are working hard to deliver those jobs. Senator Hughes, a final supplementary question. How will these investments boost the economy of my home state of New South Wales? Senator Canavan. Well, Mr. President, I might, with that question, Mr. President, go through some of the specifics. I've mentioned in general terms the total amount of jobs, a football stadium worth of jobs, but let's go to specific projects. The Coffs Harbour bypass, Mr. President, a $1.2 billion project. It's going to support 600 direct jobs 
uh, 1,800 indirect jobs will save the people of that region up to 12 minutes on their commute. The North Connects project, Mr. President, a, two, a nearly $3 billion project under construction right now, supporting nearly 9,000 direct and indirect jobs, again saving 15 minutes for people on that journey, Mr. President. The Western Sydney Infrastructure Plan, Mr. President, is a $3 billion uh, project. It's under construction now, supporting 4,000 direct and indirect jobs, and it's going to future-proof our economy and create even more jobs in the future. The more Bank intermodal terminal. Lots of jobs, another 1,300 indirect jobs and enhanced freight routes in our country. The Nowra Bridge, a $310 million project, 300 direct jobs and a three minute saving. Mr. President, I'm not going to have time to go through the whole list, uh, but there are thousands of jobs being created by the fact that we've got the Order, funding. Senator Canavan, time for the answers country. expired. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Water Minister, Senator McKenzie. Minister, in response to the numerous scandals, water theft, corruption and mismanagement that have plagued the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, the Water Minister appointed Mick Kelty as the Murray-Darling Basin Inspector General. This was more than four months ago, and yet we still have no statutory powers for him to investigate. When will the government put the legislation on the table so he can actually get on with his job, and what powers will he actually have? The Minister representing the Minister for Water Resources, Senator McKenzie. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Hanson Young, for your ongoing interest in the basin. Um, in terms of uh, the appointment of uh, Mr. Kelty to the role of Inspector General, uh, my advice is I expect the proposed legislation to create the role will be introduced into Parliament in the autumn 2020 sitting. Uh, the Department of Agriculture has commenced discussions with the basin states on the drafting of the legislation. The Interim Inspector General has been out uh, talking with stakeholders and the communities. States have raised concerns about the scope of powers of the Inspector General, and Minister Little Proud is eager to ensure that the powers of the Inspector General will provide basin communities with sufficient confidence in water management in the basin. Senator Hanson Young, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, I thank the Minister for her answer. Um, Autumn uh, 2020 is a hell of a long time off, considering that this Inspector General was meant to get on the job uh, from four months ago. Is it because, Minister, that uh, there are members of the government, uh, like perhaps Mr Joyce and Mr Taylor, who don't know and don't want the Inspector General to find things out? Senator McKenzie. Well, uh, Senator Hanson Young, I do reject uh, the underlying premise of your question. In August this year, our government announced the establishment of the Inspector General of the Murray Darling Basin Water Resources uh, as an independent, independent statutory position, holding all Commonwealth and state water agencies to account on their basin plan commitments and the laws governing water use. Uh, the Basin Ministers unanimously endorsed the new position, and the Interim Inspector General has been out and about in Basin communities, uh, listening to Basin communities and working with them uh, since his appointment. And to suggest that nothing's happening because the legislation hasn't uh, gone through the parliament is really misrepresenting how seriously the government takes this and how seriously Mr Keldy takes uh, his role. The Inspector General will be able to refer issues to the relevant authorities to ensure that the laws governing water use are followed, including investigations into allegations of water theft. He'll work with communities across the entire basin. We support staff in regional areas Order, in Senator the northern McKenzie, and southern basin. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Final supplementary, uh, Minister. There are thousands of people out the front of Parliament House today, um, many of them calling for a royal commission. Will the Inspector General be given the powers of a royal commission, or will you just do the right thing and organise one to happen so we can get to the bottom of all this muck? Senator McKenzie. Well, thank you uh, very much, Mr. President. The government supports the action being taken against serious, illegal, or fraudulent behaviour across the Murray-Darling Basin. Uh, as these basin state legal matters, uh, it's not appropriate for us to necessarily comment in specific. But in terms of the interim inspector general, he will establish a process for the receipt and assessment of allegations of non-compliance with the Water Act, the Basin Plan, and Water Resource, Resource Plans. He will refer instances of alleged non-compliance to appropriate authorities, noting the basin states and territory governments have primary responsibilities for implementing and enforcing compliance in their areas. And he will engage with the community about the basin plan implementation and associated water reforms. 
So Mr Kelty is getting about his business. He's actually looking into uh, these allegations. He's going to be setting up processes, uh, and he'll be working with communities to make sure they can have confidence uh, in the Basin Plan and its rollout. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Emissions Reduction, Senator Birmingham. I refer to his statement on the 24th of July 2019 that Mr. Taylor has always declared his interests. Does the Minister stand by that statement? Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. To the best of my knowledge, Mr. Taylor has declared his interests as required by both the House of Representatives Order. and under the Prime Minister's ministerial code of conduct. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. The Minister explained why he told the Senate that Minister Taylor has always declared his interests when Minister Taylor has failed to declare his partnership's share in GFA F1 Proprietary Limited for over five years. Five years. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr President. Uh, I'm not aware of the issue that Senator Wong refers to. Uh, I will look into that. I don't uh, take these matters at face value in the Senate chamber, uh, but if, the, if there is further information to update the Senate with, I will bring it back to the chamber. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister confirm that Mr Taylor has failed to disclose to the parliament a previous shareholding and directorship in JRAT International Proprietary Limited, a shareholding in Jamland Proprietary Limited, despite that company being subject to investigation by his own department for allegedly poisoning critically endangered grasslands, and now a shareholding held by his partnership. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. No, I do not uh, take uh, Senator Wong's assertions at face value there. Uh, Senator Wong has included in uh, his statements there matters that have been clearly dealt with already in relation to subsidiary entities or companies uh, of other uh, bodies. In relation, to the, uh, in relation to the issue that was raised on the first supplementary question, as I've indicated, if there's further information, I will come back to the chamber. Senator Coleman. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I ask that further questions be placed on a notice paper. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Watt? Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answer given by Senator Mackenzie to the question asked by Senator Green. Well, it's the last week for Parliament, and what do you know, it's another bad week for the National Party. Over the course of this last six months, since the last federal election, we've had the National Party, the junior partner in this government, who should have been triumphant after their victory in May, just gradually go down in this spiral, uh, issue after issue after issue concerning their actual base in, in rural and regional Australia, particularly when it comes to farmers and farming communities. We've seen it on the drought. We've seen, over the course of estimates and other proceedings, it exposed that all of the work that the National Party claims to be performing in the interests of farmers and farming communities to provide money for, to combat the drought is all just built on massive fibs and misrepresentations. We've seen it on the dairy as well, and of course we see it on the, in the ongoing leadership rumblings, usually surrounding Senator Canavan and other Queensland nationals. And we've seen it again today with a series of questions asked by Senator Green of Minister Mackenzie about the government's extremely poor performance on the Dairy Code of Conduct. Now, as we have said here on a number of occasions, if you can't get the National Party to care about dairy farmers in Queensland, in Victoria, in New South Wales and in other states, what can you get the National Party to do? Um, they are letting down their core voters, their core constituencies in the form of dairy farmers and farming communities generally. Now, what we've exposed over the last few months, and I recognise the efforts of Senator Hanson and Senator Roberts on this matter as well, is that uh, the National Party has profoundly let down dairy farmers uh, across Australia. They've made uh, promises, finally, under sufferance, to introduce a dairy code of conduct, but we're still waiting. We're into the final week of this parliamentary sitting, and there is still no sign of this dairy code of conduct. 
You look under it under every rock looking for the National Party's dairy code of conduct, and it's still missing. And yet again, we face, we see here today that there's no sign of this code of conduct being delivered anytime soon to save the dairy farmers that the National Party says they exist to represent. The minister was given every opportunity today by Senator Green to tell us when this dairy code of conduct would actually come into, conduct, in, into effect, and yet, yet again, there's no answers, there's no promises, there's no timeline. Dairy farmers who are fast going to the wall will have to just sit back and wait for this National Party to get its act together uh, and uh, come through on this dairy code of conduct. In, thing, in fact, things have got so bad that one of the National Party's own senators, Senator Macdonald, has had to take matters into her own hands by writing to Coles Order. and Woolworths chief, of, chief executives, uh, as well as major milk processors, urging them to sign up to the proposed code of conduct and commit to paying fairer milk prices immediately. Now, Senator Macdonald wouldn't have to do that if Minister Mackenzie was actually just doing her job and getting this dairy code of conduct uh, provided and out there into the public. But it's because Minister Mackenzie is unable uh, to do this and has had to go and do deals with uh, Senator Hanson to try to stave off leadership challenges in her own ranks uh, that now Senator Macdonald has had to take matters into her own, ha own hands. Uh, the extraordinary situation we saw here in Question Time today, where irrigators from the Murray-Darling Basin who've travelled here have ended up walking out on a National Party agriculture minister. I don't think anyone's seen farming communities walk out literally during question time on answers that we see from a National Party uh, agriculture minister. That shows you the level of difficulty this minister in and the National Party in general is in. And what this goes to more generally is an incredible split that we see opening up day by day within the National Party. I mean, the body language that was on display from all of the other National Party senators here today was something to be beholden. You've got the National Party's own deputy leader, the Agriculture Minister, on her feet, trying to defend herself uh, from the accusations that she hasn't done her job on the Murray Darling, on Dairy Code of Conduct, and the level of misery on the faces of National Party uh, senators was something to be beholden. Uh, but chief among them, of course, is Senator Canavan, because we know that Senator Canavan and the other Queensland National senators and members of parliament cannot wait to get rid of Sen Senator Mackenzie uh, out of the deputy leader's spot because they want it for one of their own. They want it for a Queensland National Party. They have never accepted Senator Mackenzie, and I predict that before the week is out, we are going to be hearing more about leadership rumblings in the National Thank Party. Thank you, Senator Watt. Your time has expired. Order. Order. Senator Abetz. Madam Deputy President, if there was a look of misery on the face of National Party senators, I would imagine it is because they have to look at Labor senators during question time, and that would be quite understandable. Quite understandable. Because what the National Party senators are confronted with is a suggestion by the Labor Party that they are somehow concerned about dairy issues and drought. Yet, bar one question, every single question was not about government but gutter. It was dredging the gutter in relation to an issue that is being investigated by New South Wales Police for only one reason, that the serial letter writer, Mark Dreyfus, the shadow attorney, has yet again written a vexatious, vacuous, venal letter to a police authority seeking to have an investigation into somebody in the coalition. And what have all those letters um, turned Senator to? Senator Abetz, please resume your seat. Senator Wong. So I'm sorry, um, Deputy President, but I think the motion moved was in relation to um, answers given to Senator Green's question. Uh, beg your pardon. Uh, it was. Yes, I remind senators this is a broad-ranging debate, and I'm listening carefully. And I'm sure Senator Abetz will address the specifics of the taking note. Madam Deputy President, actions speak so much louder than words, and Senator Watt pretended that the Australian Labor Party were concerned about drought and dairy, yet their actions in this question time belied that by virtue of the fact that each and every single question, bar one, was addressed to the issue of Mr Dreyfus's vacuous, venal, nasty letter to 
the police. And they then suggest that there is now a criminal investigation into the minister. Taylor, wrong. It is an investigation in response to Mr Dreyfus's letter and, given past performance of Mr Dreyfus's letters, we will see a lot of taxpayer money being spent on an investigation into that rather than crime and corruption in New South Wales and elsewhere. And what's going to be the result? A big fat duck egg, zero, nil, nothing, zilch. That is what always happens with the letters that come out of Mr Dreyfus's office. And so let the public be very, very much reminded that whilst I'm sure Senator Watt will post up on social media his little five-minute speech as an indication of the Labor Party's concern on dairy and drought, the simple fact is that is not part and parcel of their modus operandi because it is not about the government that they have a concern. Their attraction is to the gutter and the trawling of the issue to which I have referred. Now, look, let's make no mistake. Dairy farmers are doing it tough. They have done it tough in the past. They will do it tough again in the future. And I am sure that with the assistance of good policy, there will be a better and brighter future for the dairy sector. Now, if you are to have a code of conduct, if you want some government interference or assistance or help, what would you seek to do? Would you just say Canberra knows all the answers, or would you actually go about consulting? Yeah. Wouldn't that be a good, idea? a good idea? And what's more, that's exactly what Senator McKenzie has done. Yeah. And you know what? If Senator McKenzie would have come into this place and said, I've got a code, here it is, end of story. Who would have been the first people to criticise for lack of consultation? It would have been the Australian Labor Party with a little note for social media to say the minister has not consulted. This is the sort of typical display you get from an opposition that has resigned itself to opposition because it is unable to present good positive policy platforms for the people of Australia to consider. They will trawl the gutter and then they pretend that they're interested in an issue and they say, what has the minister done? We will say the exact opposite. Minister consulting, she should have acted. If the minister would have acted, the argument from that opposition would have been she should have consulted. So it's one of these no-win situations and I have no doubt that the Australian farming community, in particular the Australian dairy farming community, understand that in the Australian Labor Party they do not have a friend. Indeed, they have somebody that has never sought to look after the rural sector. And we on the coalition side make no apology for consulting and seeking to support the vital dairy industry of this nation. Thank you, Senator Abetz. Senator Green. Well, as the uh, senators opposite congratulate themselves on uh, doing anything and everything to talk about something other than their complete failure to the dairy farmers, um, I am going to talk about clearly what has happened in this chamber today, and that is an overpouring of anger by dairy farmers. It is clear that dairy farmers and farmers across the country are angry. And we, on this side, understand that anger. It is tough times for farmers all across the country. And we know that there are really tough times ahead. Uh, if the drought continues and those farmers continue to suffer from the drought, things are going to get even tougher. And what, this, what those farmers want, and I have met with those um, representatives from the dairy farmers in Queensland, there is a very big uh, collection of dairy farmers up in the tablelands in far north Queensland, close to where I live in Cairns. Is, is 45 a small number for you, Senator Rennick? Because I think one dairy farmer is good enough for me to stand up here and represent them. Is 45 farmers not enough for you to get up and tell the minister that she should do her job? Because I will stand up here and defend every single one of those farmers, whether it's 45, 55, 450, because they are people who deserve the respect of this chamber instead of getting 
swatted away by the Minister for the Agriculture when we put questions to her about what she's doing. It is obvious that farmers are angry because they are being ignored by this government. The Nationals have let down dairy farmers. They have voted in this chamber against motions to make sure that legislation is discussed, that we have the debate here, that we get some processes moving. But they don't want to do that because they're protecting the Minister for Agriculture. Today, when I asked the Minister for Agriculture questions about this code of conduct and what is going to be happening, we got cynical answers and lecturing and condescending from uh, Senator McKenzie about trying to tell the Labor Party about supply chain. Well, I can tell you this. Farmers do not need any more cynical, condescending lectures from the government. What they want to see is action. And it is surprising that we have seen a letter from, letter from Senator Macdonald sent to um, supermarkets about this issue. And the, uh, senators opposite want to pretend as if this isn't something that should be focused on. But I can tell you that Senator Macdonald would not have to send that letter if, the Senate, if Senator Mackenzie was doing her job. Why does George Christensen have a campaign petition on insurance on, on his website? Because the government is refusing to do its job. When there are members of the National Party and backbenchers out there campaigning against the government, you really have to wonder who is listening to who. This is systematic of a complete breakdown of this government representing the constituencies that matter to those members opposite. Now, I am deeply concerned that we are not going to see the action that dairy farmers need to be able to um, prevent the closure of their dairy farms. We've had, um, this has been a very hot topic in far north Queensland where I live, and I do um, lament about the you know, um, frustrations of dairy farmers and the people who have written into the Cairns Post about this. There's certainly been a lot of anger, a lot of um, uh, debate about this, and it is <laughs> frustrating when, um, I guess, the member for Leichhardt um, uh, wrote a, a letter to the editor on this issue. And I want to share with you a response that, we, that um, was received uh, from, the, um, from a member of that community. He says, this is John, uh, Jerry from Tolga. <clears throat> For the dairy industry, he has never done anything positive. That's what he said about the member for Leichhardt. He said, why didn't Warren host a meeting with Tableland dairy farmers prior to the July the 1st, 1999, when his LNP colleagues under then Prime Minister John Howard deregulated the dairy industry? No good talking it out there, other people. Can you, can you guarantee a resurrection Order. of daring to the tablelands back to 300-plus farmers through your so-called unwavering support? We are waiting for that miracle to happen, not fairy tales. Thank you, Senator Green. Your time has expired. Senator Rennick, you have constantly interjected. Interjections are disorderly. I would ask you to discontinue that, please. Senator Davey. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, let, Order. Let's make no mistake. The farmers who are out here outside protesting today are not here protesting just about dairy. They are protesting about the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, which was drafted and developed by the Labor Party. And without, Order. when you talk to the farmers, they will say there was a decided lack of consultation in developing the Basin Plan. They are also protesting about the impact of buybacks. Buybacks were a Labor Party policy which our government has capped. So that's what those farmers out there are, are protesting about. Let's not conflate the two ish issues. We know we are consulting on the dairy a uh, mandatory code of conduct. We were asked to consult. We did consultations in the drafting phase. We released the exposure draft and we've con consulted again. We are collating the feedback because 
No one wants a poorly drafted policy. That can be much worse than no policy at all. So we are making sure we get this policy right based on our consultations, based on feedback from the industry. Now, Senator Green says she's consulted with Queensland dairy farmers. Congratulations to her. But Senator McKenzie, the Agriculture Minister, has to be the Minister for Agriculture across the whole of Australia, not just for Queensland dairy farmers. And make no mistake, there is not wide-reaching support for a floor price, which is the Labor Party policy, which they are working with Senator Hanson to ensure they get their, party, their policy uh, put through. We will not accept that. We listen to the, the broader industry, and I have feedback from the New South Wales Farmers Federation Dairy Committee just today, where they support investigation into a regional floor price, where they support the current Senate inquiry that is underway, because that gives them the opportunity to participate in the process. They have concerns on the model as proposed by Senator Hanson, and they believe it needs further investigation. That is what we are doing, and we are working with industry to make sure that we get the mandatory code of conduct, as recommended by the ACCC, in place and right and operational as quickly as possible. So for the Labor Party to say that we have turned our backs on dairy far farmers is completely offensive and completely incorrect. We are the ones sitting at the table with the dairy farmers from across all states to find out exactly what they want, to address their concerns in our mandatory code of conduct, to get the mandatory code of conduct in place and then to further discuss with them how we can support their industry going forward, including by looking at divestiture powers for supermarkets to see if that's required, if that will provide a better and more competitive marketplace so that our farmers get paid appropriate prices for their produce. Because let me make it clear, it was not consumers who demanded $1 a litre milk, it was the big retailers who decided that consumers would want a dollar of litre milk. It was the big retailers who undermined the value of our high-quality agricultural produce. And that's where we need to address our attention, and that is where we in the National Party will be focusing in the, in the next year to make sure that we have a thorough look at our retailers, their market powers, and if action needs to be taken, to make it a better and fairer operating environment for our producers, as well as our processors and the retailers, then we will take that action. Because we do support our agricultural industries, all of them, our beef producers, our dairy producers and our croppers, and that's why we've got the Water for Fodder program out today, to get some water out there so that farmers can produce fodder because this drought is ongoing. This drought is crippling across the board. And we want to stand with our farmers and do what we can that will not undermine property rights, that will support our farmers, that will importantly be the right decision. Thank you, Senator for our Davey. Your time has expired. Senator Stirl. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I just urge senators, and you know, I've been here a long time. And we get passionate about issues and challenges in this nation, but it does us, as legislators of this fine nation, no, no decency or good to hear senators interjecting all the time through taking note when we're talking about one of the greatest challenges we're facing. And I am absolutely embarrassed to the poor people sitting into the chamber and those who may have been listening and tuning in from the comments being thrown across the chamber at each other, senators who couldn't keep their mouth shut for long enough than 10 seconds to start trying to interject and belittle other senators, the senator accused has left the chamber. It's probably Senator the best Stirl. thing that he has Senator done Stirl. in his short term. It's yes. not appropriate to refer yeah. to right. senators, whether they're present or not. All right, Please Senator Rennick's not here, so I won't refer to Senator Rennick. Um, but Senator, I will. Senator Stirl, oh, I've just that? called it to your attention. Oh, okay. All right. Thank okay. you. Okay. I will not apologise for being embarrassed. 
I will not apologise to say we saw farmers, and I've never met the farmers. And I don't know if they're irrigators. I don't know if they were dairy farmers. I don't know if they were a collection of both industries. I'm not. I have no idea. But you could see the anger in the people in the gallery. And what do we have here? The Minister for Agriculture is on her feet. She'd been asked a question from Senator Davey. The anger, they stormed out. They all left. While, while all of us, are, all of you over there are trying to defend or whatever you may be, let us not forget. May I just remind Madam Deputy President, those in the gallery, you've been in government seven years over there. This issue just hasn't popped up in the last couple of sitting weeks. These issues, these challenges have been here for many, many times. Senator Pavey, I know you're trying your best to defend your part of the world, as you may do, but you know what? You don't realise how silly you sounded or how condescending you sounded when you had a go at Senator Green because she quoted that Senator Macdonald had written about Queensland dairy farmers. Your response is, you don't, you know, not in these words, I can't quite remember because I was shaking my head so hard it nearly fell off, that the minister has to look after all farmers, not just Queensland. Well, I think Senator Macdonald has got the right to look after her and have her concerns, the same as Senator uh, Hanson had the right to protect and defend and represent her, fa her farmers, the dairy farmers, who are the same as Senator McDonald's. And I am very, very, very well aware of this, of the bullying tactics from the top of the supply chain. I can't tell you, I think Lyon's one of them, and we've invited Coles and we've invited Woolies, and I think we invited Aldi come here next week and hey, come and have a chat to us because I'm told scenic rim dairy farmers are actually getting their, their feet nailed to the floor now because on December the 9th, December the 9th, only about uh, what's that, three days, four or five days away, are being forced and bullied into signing in contracts that will lock them in, I believe, don't quote me, for 69 cents a litre. Oh, I, said to, I said to Senator Macdonald, can't they just tell them, well, stop, we don't want to sign it while we're waiting for the, 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 the mandatory code that eventually is going to get here one day, we're told. And you know what the answer was, Senator Davey, through you, Madam Deputy President, was if they do, they, get, they, they lose their bonuses and they're down to 50 cents a, a litre. As someone who has had to um, uh, fight for years in my work life to get my rates when I was a self-employed truck driver. I know what the power of negotiation is from the top down. So how condescending and disgraceful the behaviour has been here today. It doesn't hurt in this nation. You know, it really doesn't hurt in this nation. Politicians have the, they think they know everything. Sadly, they don't. But they have the ability to actually say at times, when you listen to the Australian people, well, I was going to do this, but you know what? Maybe I'm not the gatekeeper to all intelligence. Maybe I'm not, or I haven't got it right. Maybe I should consult further. If people are angry enough to come down here, and with all due respect to Canberra, it's a lovely place to visit, but I think farmers have got better things to do, or would rather be somewhere else, the least we can do is pay them the decency to sit down with them. Now, we don't have the be-all and the end-all and the fix-all. We don't have the magic bullet. But I've got to tell you what I'm hearing here. We could be doing a hell of a lot more as a nation. We're very good at collecting taxes. We're very good at getting photographs taken of us. Oh my, aren't we goodness, we're going to cut this ribbon and open another piece of infrastructure that's been around for 30 years. But you dare come to us with a real serious problem that we've got people driven off the land. We've got dairy farmers that we're losing. I don't know how many we're losing. One a day, I'm told, in Queensland. And the best that senators can do on that side is throw insults and barbs at other senators across this side of the table. Really, seriously, is this? Do we pride ourselves going into not only the last week of our sitting year to think that we have done the Australian people a, a, a major justice by, by defending very poor legislation, by defending statements oh, that are uh, now a year Thank you, Senator off? Stirl. Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Green to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise today to take note of the answers given uh, to my question to, by Senator uh, McKenzie, who is representing uh, the Water Minister. I asked in relation to just the fiasco that is um, unfolding throughout the Murray Darling Basin. We know that the Murray Darling Basin has been plagued with scandal after scandal, uh, incidents of water theft, of corruption, of mismanagement, of maladministration. And of course, the government knows that these things are becoming more and more palpable, that they have to act, which is why in August 
uh, this year, some four months ago, the Water Minister announced that uh, Mr Mick Kelty uh, would act as the, uh, as the Inspector General for the Murray-Darling Basin to be able to investigate these issues. Well, we all welcomed that, and yet what have we seen, uh, Madam Deputy President? Nothing. Um, we know that the Inspector General is uh, carrying out um, a number of meetings, but he has no powers to act. There is no legislation to give uh, the Inspector General the powers, uh, the uh, terms of reference, the ability for him to do his job. And what this shows, uh, Madam Deputy President, is it, it is all lip service from this government when it comes to the people living along the Murray-Darling Basin, those communities who are relying on the, the river and, of course, on those downstream who desperately need to make sure that this river is managed fairly and properly and sustainably. Um, where are the investigation powers to ensure that the Inspector General can get in there and to sort out what is going on? Where are the referrals from the Inspector General uh, to indeed a uh, national uh, corruption body, a corruption watchdog, an integrity commission? These are the things that this government promised would happen, and yet we have none of it. There's no statutory powers. Uh, for uh, the Inspector General, so he's got no ability to do his job, and there is still no anti-corruption body of which he could even refer uh, issues of corruption and maladministration to. Now, many, many people from a diverse, uh, uh, you know, stretches of the Murray-Darling Basin, those who are both um, uh, smaller farmers and irrigators, those who live in the communities who rely on a healthy river, and of course. Um, those who are the lower ends of the system who are struggling um, in what is a mismanaged um, river system are calling out for a royal commission because we can't trust this government to either clean up their own act, clean up the act of the states who have uh, been behaving badly and to make sure this is all done in a transparent and open manner. We can't trust them. We can't even trust them. Madam Deputy President, to put in place an Inspector General with the powers to get the job done. So while this government thought that all they needed to do was make an announcement, put out a press release, uh, give somebody a title and that would be okay, well, we are not fooled, Madam Deputy President. We are not fooled at all. Uh, this government is up Crap Creek without a plan for managing the Murray-Darling Basin. They've got no idea what they're doing. They've got no ability to crack down to, to, uh, to deal with the corruption, uh, the maladministration and, uh, and the water theft issues that have happened. And what we've got in the midst now of a drying climate are more and more people with their backs against the wall. Just outside on the front lawns of Parliament House is well over a thousand people gathered there demanding that this government take serious action on the Murray-Darling Basin. They are sick of the lip service. They are sick of the broken promises. And at the very least, this government should have put in place some powers for the fellow they want and say we'll clean up the place to be able to get on and do it. And yet here we have uh, the minister today in response to my questions saying we'll have to wait till at least till at least autumn next year. So by the time this is all put in place, we might be looking at 12 months down the line from the first announcement. This just shows this government is not taking seriously at all. The plight of river communities, the very serious concern of those uh, watching uh, and concerned about the sustainability of the river system. And let me point out, Madam Deputy President, this isn't about farmers versus the environment. This is about those who act corruptly, those who are making a monster out of running this system badly versus everybody else. It's corporations versus community Thank versus you, river Senator communities Hanson versus Young. the Your environment. Your time has expired. So the question is, the motion is moved to take note. It's moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We'll now move to petitions and I call the